first session of this workshop, and uh, we will start uh, with uh, Miguel Rodriguez, who is coming uh, from uh, Rennes, and we will talk about uh, large magnetic field regimes and asymptotic preserving schemes. So thanks for the introduction, Oscar, I thought of the invitation. Um, I've enjoyed the, the talk so far. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it's, uh, the, the first serious thing I should say is that uh, uh, everything I will discuss today is coming from joint work with Francis Hibay, and part of it also includes uh, Ahmed uh, Sakazadeh. Um, okay, so the context is like that. I'm interested in questions that are um, of importance for uh, fusion devices. Okay, so you have the plasma, meaning uh, the gas or charged particles, and uh, you want it to be very hot. Uh, with high pressure, some particle have to be very fast, but you also want the particle not to be eating the whole all the time, so they need to be confined by something. So the only way to go very far, no, very fast without going very far is just to oscillate. Okay, so we, we, you act with a strong magnetic field so that you have strong oscillations, and uh, um, but for this strong oscillation, they typically have a very small radius, so you, you expect that you will be able to get a description that, uh, of the large scale by forgetting the oscillations. Okay, and try to capture what is the slow dynamic. And uh, this is more or less the kind of thing I want to discuss. Uh, I want to get some proof of this with these claims, and uh, also to design schemes that are compatible with that. Okay, typically, you think that if, if uh, at the continuous level you can forget about the fast oscillation, so probably you'll be able to design schemes that are also able to get the slow dynamics without resolving the fast oscillation. So with coarse matches. And, um, Okay, and the, the last thing I want to say here is that the, uh, at the analytic level, we are essentially stuck to ever some, some things that are geometrically trivial. Okay, so if, when you take into account nonlinear things, then we are stuck to very simple geometries. Or uh, you discard the, the, the nonlinear equation, part of the equation, and you discard the field equation, the Maxwell equation, or Poisson equation, and, and then you can consider. Uh, more complex uh, geometries, and this is what I will focus on today. Okay, I will restrict to linear PDs, uh, but, but uh, general geometries. And, and for this reason, actually, uh, I will discuss mostly ODs. Okay, uh, so there will not be very much uh, kinetic equation. Okay, not, not uh, okay. so I try to start with things very simple. I think. Uh, just to explain the mechanism of what happens. Uh, so these are the Newton equation in 2D, where you, the only force is a Lorentz force with magnetic field that is uh, uh, just uh, constant. And uh, we are only focusing on, on the transfer dynamics. Okay, so we forget about what happens when, uh, along the magnetic field. And uh, of course, this is very simple. You can do a lot of things about that. But I want to explain uh, the kind of things that is uh, robust enough so that you can deal with uh, general things in the Okay, so you have some epsilon in the equation, so you expect that uh, you can use this epsilon to, to uh, know what is small, what is large, and things like that. But first, you need to get some bound to be sure that the uh, things you think are of size at most <coughs> one are indeed of size at most one. On this thing, this is uh, completely trivial because the modulus of V is constant, and then you get a free bound for X, just integrating the first equation. And, uh, and then I want to, s to start saying that, okay, X is uh, slow, okay, there's no epsilon here, it's of size at most one. And, uh, but I, I want to get some kind of uh, equation for x that is on top of one d. And for this, I will use the fact that d is oscillating. Okay. Because it's oscillating, it is, uh, it is small in, in some sense. It is small if you accept to lose regularity. Okay. It is small in, in uh, spaces with negative indices. In this, in and uh, the way to see that is uh, to, to you look at the equation that makes him oscillating, and, and you see that it tells you actually if you are the derivative of something on the side. And then you can use that in this equation, you plug it there, and you see that x is epsilon close to someone that is not moving at all. And when you integrate that, you get the fact that uh, x is actually close to something not moving, uh, epsilon close. Okay, this is very simple, this you can write in more directly than that, but this scheme, this is the one, the scheme that you can uh, go on with uh, for the full picture. Okay. And one thing you've already seen here is that I think that my bound here was a bit pessimistic on large time. So you can improve that just by using this bound here. Okay, so let's go to something maybe a bit more 
bit less real, but okay, not hard ever. Uh, now I'm including an electric field. Uh, you can play the same game, so you have three bounds, it's in one short time. Uh, you can use the, the equation that tells you that V is uh, at leading order just oscillating to tell, to tell you that V is uh, the derivative of something outside the time plus something outside the time. You plug it in the equation for X and you get an equation like that. Okay. And once again, you can inter integrate that and get a bound like that. That tells you that, uh, again, X is epsilon close to something that you have And, uh, yeah, but of course, here you see that you are missing something. So there is a motion that is just slower than what point you are looking for. There is an electric drift, and if you, if you want to capture the electric drift, you have to do something else. Okay, so we have to there's actually at least two ways to do that. One of them is to say, okay, x is moving too fast for this electric drift, I should move to another variable that is moving at the uh, velocity epsilon. And you see a variable like that here. You see that uh, this thing is moving at the speed of atmospheric epsilon. Uh, so you can look at this. Okay, let's do that. Uh, this is an important variable that has a, okay, this is well known in the theory, this is a guy in the center. And uh, if you switch to this variable, then okay, you get a formulation like that. And uh, this is easy to see that uh, indeed your epsilon square flows to someone that is uh, following the rate. Okay, there's another way, uh, which is to say, okay, I will focus on x, just on x. I don't care about the guidance center. Uh, but then since I have something of size epsilon in the equation, I have to wait for a time of size 1 over epsilon. And, and, uh, and uh, I have to do large time estimate. But of course, my, my uniform bounds are not good anymore because there are, there, are, there are no problem, no problem time bounds. Then I, I want to prove that I can get uh, large time estimates first. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, the bad thing is that V is not completely oscillating. It's forced by something of size 1. And, and, uh, to see that uh, the cyclic bounding on larger time, uh, but I'd like to get the fact that uh, this is oscillating up to something of size epsilon. Okay? So this is not true for V, but this is true for an epsilon correction of V. Okay? If you look at the equation, you see that you can write this as a peak, the perp of something uh, that is an epsilon correction of V, and then uh, you get a new, a new variable that is more pure <coughs> oscillating than V itself. And, the, and when, once you have this, formulation, you can integrate directly and get a good bound in the sense that uh, it's something that is fine and maximum is fine. Uniformly fine. Okay, so this is the first way to do that. Let me show you a second way uh, that would be useful for, for later arguments. That is uh, starting from the fact that this is not really V uh, that is oscillating, which is just the angle of V. Okay, so the modulus is actually slow. Uh, in the toy model, it is constant here, yeah, it's slowly moving. Okay, so you may start with this. Okay, this is, <coughs> this is slow in the sense that there's no one right sign here. Uh, not only is this slow, but you see there's a, a V here. Uh, and you can replace it using again the V is oscillating. And then you get something like that. Okay, you can get an equation for an epsilon modification of the kinetic energy. And, and once, once you integrate that, you get the same kind of part, something that is fine for an external T sign. Okay, whatever way you choose, <coughs> then you have the correct bounds to do the large time uh, uh, estimate. Uh, okay, you can integrate that and get something like that. Okay, now x is uh, epsilon close to something that is solving the equation with the drift, but on a time that is uh, okay, anything but with epsilon t finite, that's fine. Okay, and then on this large time, you see the effect of drift. Okay. I say there will be almost no PD, this is the only part we have discussed with the fact that uh, if I, we are just considering linear PDs, then we can translate this to a very statistical mechanics level. Okay, this is easy to do, but I want to explain uh, the abstract way of doing that. Uh, okay, so you start with, a, you have a flow for some initial PDs, like the Newton equation we've seen before. You have a reduced flow for the slow part, something that you expect to be with like the, the one with the electric drift in, in the equation before, and you have a slow map, okay, something that tells you in X there are some slow coordinates and I'm able to describe them in okay. okay, and then uh, uh, you start with some kind of uh, estimate as we've seen before, something that tells you that if you look at the slow part of the full dynamics, this is close to being just uh, following the, the, the reduced flow starting from the, the slow map. And you get a way here that tells you how it depends on the initial datum and time. And it should be small. Okay. And you get a point of line like that. 
And then you want to go from that to the static mechanics point of view. And this is relatively easy. Now I'm looking at just the density of particles. Things are completely linear. Uh, and when, when you okay, when, when particles are moving with, with uh, this vector field, then this is the equation satisfied by the, the density. And if you want to just restrict to the density of uh, the, the slow variable, then you just have to push all that f by the slow map. And you get, uh, from the present bound, you get for free the fact that if you compare uh, the, the reduced density to someone solving the limiting PD, then you get the bound you, you expect. Okay, and you, you just uh, you may use a point class estimate, you get it integrated here, and the right topology to do that, if you start with one class bound, is uh, this uh, double minus one uh, topology, and uh, it is just due on to double one infinity, and this is also the W, the Bastion one distance. Okay, so this is, this is the topology that is the easy topology to conduct uh, point class estimate on, on particles to, to density. So this is almost a, and that's almost trivial as a, as a nothing here. This is what you get for, for free if you, and this is for this kind of reason that I'm insisting in trying to get the explicit dependencies on, on the bounds, just because then if you plug it there, and, and you, you see that that tells you how, how, how many momentum, you, how many moments in velocity you lose, and things like that. Okay. So a few remarks, okay, push forward if you want. Not so familiar with that. Uh, the easy way to define it is just by gravity. Okay, this is the dual of composition. Uh, and, um, I've already said that uh, solving this uh, is exactly the same as pushing forward by the flow. And uh, you may have in mind that if you want to forget the oscillation, the right way is to just uh, average the density. And uh, this is uh, a way to average that is the right way, the way to keep des probability densities. And, uh, if, if, if everything is smooth and nice, then, then this push forward is indeed given by just the averaging of the So let me give a, an example related to what we have done so far. If you start with uh, just the Vlasov equation corresponding to the Newton equation we've seen, and you, you consider as just a slow map, just you keep x, you forget about v, uh, then taking the push forward is just uh, considering the macroscopic density, and you get the, the estimates here. You see that you lose a one moment in velocity in the estimate. <coughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Let me go on, just uh, making things slight, okay, more and more complex on the road. Uh, again, I, I take a magnetic field that is uh, with a constant direction, but now I have a, a darling uh, modulus of the, of, the, of the magnetic field. Okay, so this depends on time and space. And, uh, and already to analyze this kind of things, you have to use the right techniques. Okay, there are many techniques, different kind of techniques that, that we are working so far, and that's sought to work uh, with uh, this kind of examples. Okay. So anyway, you may start to do the same thing as before. You use this equation that uh, that we to remove v in this equation, and you see what happens. Uh, so the main thing is here is that here after this, uh, you still have some v here. Okay, to eliminate. Uh, the linear one you can still eliminate in the same way. Okay. You can use the equation for V again and replace it again. Okay. You can just iterate that. But then you have also some uh, quadratic terms. Okay. And this is, of course, not true, but this V is oscillating, but doesn't tell you nothing about the oscillation of this square. Okay, so you have to think a bit about that. It's not hard yet to consider that. Uh, okay, so to do that, let me go back to uh, just a dumb example, just uh, to see uh, what is really happening. So I take someone solving that, pure oscillation, I look at uh, quadratic terms. And I want to understand what is the slow part of this quadratic term. That is the part that you cannot uh, get rid of by using the, the oscillations. And a uh, okay, small computation gives you that this is uh, the trace of Q times the kinetic energy. And then, okay, there is something which is a time and time, and the derivative of time. And, uh, and this is really something slow, okay, because the kinetic energy is a slow line. But the thing that is new compared to the previous case is that uh, you cannot uncouple, because of that, you cannot uncouple the, the stationary dynamics from the dynamics of the kinetic energy. Okay, you have to consider both to uh, And this is the, uh, more or less what happens in general. The, the, the concept magnetic case is a bit too special. If you have only one, one uh, phase that is oscillating, you can, in principle, you can only forget about one variable. This means that you should have a three dimensional system. 
And this is what I put happening here. You, know, you can also prove that you have an error bound on large time with a, you know, epsilon, but now you have a system for it. Where you, you couple the spatial position and the distribution of kinetic motion. Uh, yeah, of course, if you, if you, okay, this is consistent. If you take B constant, then you see that uh, this, you get rid of that, and, and the first equation is uncoupled from the second. And if B is constant, and, and moreover, E is curl free, then, then uh, Actually, the, the kinetic energy is, is for constant for limiting mode. This is not true for the original mode, it's something uh, that you get in the limit. Okay, so it's, this is really an adaptive right? so that is moving slower than, than most of it. And if B is not constant, you also have another thing that is that has this property, which is E over B. If you look at E over B, and you assume that uh, this vanishes, okay, this is actually far less low. So, for instance, if B doesn't depend on time, and D are from potential. That this variable for the limiting system is also constant. Okay, so again, this is an adiabatic invariant. This is just called the adiabatic invariant, but like the most classical one, which is actually that. Okay. And I, I will, okay, I already say that I will not show you anything about nonlinear PD, but of course, we have done things about nonlinear PDs, in particular the numerical level. One of the classical tests you can do. Uh, to, to see that you capture quite this limit is to check that you have uh, an adiabatic invariance of this quantity at a static level. Okay, I will not show you this uh, mostly because of time, but uh, this is a classical test. Okay, so at last I'm going to 3D. Uh, I, I'll give less on less details. Uh, it's getting a bit early at some point. Uh, so now the magnetic field can vary also in position and depends on, on everything. And uh, the, the perp operator is not dependent on time and space. And, and, but still, what happens is that if you look at the main oscillation, the fast one is uh, the one where V is oscillating uh, around the magnetic field. Okay, so this is a perpendicular component of V that is already oscillating. Okay, so to capture that, you have uh, some interest in, in just uh, cutting in two pieces the parallel and perpendicular. And uh, the kinetic energy that you are interested in is just the perpendicular part. And the same for B. Okay, so this is the equation. You can play the same game, uh, except that now you cannot replace B, but just the perp. Okay, you do that. Um, and uh, you have a five dimensional slow, slow variables. So the position, the parallel velocity, and the kinetic energy in the perpendicular direction. And you may start replacing the perp everywhere okay? uh, in this equation. So this is of order one, and you may start replacing things everywhere. And you already get something that is not trivial at the linear order. It's not constant. Uh, yeah, this is not inconsistent with the 2D case. It's just that in the 2D case, we have decided to not uh, look at the, what happens parallel to the magnetic fields. Otherwise, we, we would have seen these things, for instance. Okay. You, you have a motion of the, the, the magnetic field. We have just decided not to look at it. Uh, and you see that if uh, the, E parallel is constant, then, then you get really something that is just a motion along the, uh, the magnetic field. Okay. It's going to be false. Okay, it's so really something non trivial, but uh, as you may guess, you, you are failing to capture the main things. And for instance, if you look at an example like that, uh, okay, so the blue line are, are the real particle uh, trajectories, and uh, the dark line here is uh, the, what you get by solving just the first order. Okay, so at first, this is okay, you're just following what happens. But since you're missing the, the slow drift, uh, okay, you just uh, you keep doing this and that, whereas the particle is slowly drifting along the, the, the steer. Okay. Uh, okay, so you, you want to capture the drift. So for instance, the electric drift we've seen in the case. Okay, so this is the electric drift, but there are many of us in free. Okay, they, yeah, they have names in physics literature, and it's hard to recognize them. But they are not so mm, they are not so ugly once you're used to them. To, to, to okay, you can get some interpretation, of, some intuition, or just to get it. Anyway, uh, the, the, you can write uh, some uh, global drift that includes all of them. Uh, if you look a bit at uh, what was happening in uh, here. In this quantity here, you see that you have a, a convective derivative of the E parallel. You can get rid of the part of V per, but you, the, it remains the important quantity that gives us a convective derivative 
along the of e parallel along e parallel. Okay, and, and this is the, the sigma here. Okay, this is just uh, this is essentially the drift coming from that. Okay, so you, if you want to see them, one way is to uh, look for things that are slower. So in the beginning, guidance angel variables. So we know this one already, uh, but you have to correct all the other ones. And, the, and the, what is the correction is given to you by just you know, when you replace the mean pair in the equation, you get the correction. And uh, there is essentially no choice if you uh, enforce the fact that uh, all of this should have no slow components. They are truly fast. If you assume that, then there should be no choice in the correction. Okay. So if you look at this variable, you can get an epsilon square description by something that is solving uh, an ODE with uh, v, v naught that you already know, plus epsilon v1, and this one you, 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 you see the rates on all the other terms. And there's a lot of structure coming from there. Okay, the equation has a lot of structure. We are not using though, okay, but if you are seeing more things on fields, then you have a lot of geometric structure. Okay. But I insist on okay, I insist on not using it because in the end I will design schemes like this. But try to mimic that, and I want to get uh, as many schemes as I want. And for this reason, I don't want to stick to geometric schemes. Okay, so I, I, I want to do normal schemes without uh, following the geometry, and this is sufficient to capture this. But I mean, I don't need to use uh, any Hamiltonian structure or Lagrangian structure or whatsoever. Okay. And, uh, okay, so this is the way where you, you, you look at the guiding center variables. And you may say, okay, I don't care about getting secure variables. Instead of that, I want to do large time. Uh, but there, there's actually something hidden in, in the large time uh, to the case, which is related to the fact that you have the, the oscillation at order one and sign, okay, this you forget about, and then you have the thing at order one. So if you want to go to large time, you, you need to be able to ensure that the order one dynamics is uh, also confining, and, and uh, okay, it's oscillating. Then when you go to large time, you want to forget about this part, this oscillation also. There are two oscillations, one right side and the one. And uh, so this is something that we have hidden in the two decades because we are totally forgotten about the, the, the parallel direction. Okay. But otherwise, you need a, okay, that, that makes two things. The thing that you need a very specific geometric structure uh, on the magnetic fields to get this, to get the fact that the other one uh, dynamics is also confining. And, and, uh, and then, if you want to look lar large time, you need to forget about these this, uh, phases, okay, these new phases, the slower phases. Uh, okay, we are far from understanding everything on, on this, uh, but there's an example of that in, in our paper, but I don't want to talk about it. Okay, and uh, yeah, the good point is that uh, on, on our example, you see that uh, with a similar round model, you capture the, the slow drift. Okay. Of course, not the ripples, because I mean, they are, they are coming from the oscillation we are trying to forget about. <coughs> okay, so that's all for the analytic part, and I want to, to uh, go to uh, schemes. Okay. A few general words, they're very fast. Uh, so we are in a situation where we have a small SMP part of the same sign table. And we understand what, for the continuous model what happens when epsilon goes to zero. And then we want to compute uh, the solutions out of that. And uh, this will introduce some discretization parameters. And then you have many small parameters. Okay. And if you want to get some kind of uniformity, then you're forced to the fact that uh, this, this limit should commute. Okay. This is forced by the uniformity. If you, if you have some kind of uniformity, then you, you'll be able to take limits uh, in any sense you want. And, and we want these kind of things. I must say that I think we want this kind of thing only for the slow dynamics. So this is the one that you expect to take limits on. And so uh, we expect that we, by designing and correcting the schemes, we will be able to compute the slow dynamics even when the, okay, the, the meshes are too rough to capture with the fast solution. And, uh, and another way to, uh, to think about that is that you want to get a good accuracy on the slow variables all the way down, okay, because they are not stiff. You should be able to do that uh, more correctly. Yeah, and also, I, mean, I don't know if you really satisfy this constraint, but uh, we want to use normal schemes as many as possible, uh, okay, not to design things in, in a way that is too special to, to operate, <coughs> and to be able to go to higher levels. Uh, okay, two words about uh, 
Yeah, I, I'm not giving you a lot of references, but I think let's discuss a few of these ones. Uh, there's this one paper by a group that uh, is coming from Strasbourg, in some sense, uh, with a similar goal, but with a very different kind of, uh, very different kind of, uh, of techniques, solutions. So I will not discuss this too far. Uh, and then there's a group in REN uh, that is uh, more focused on a question that is slightly different, which is uh, the fact of they, they want to capture some uh, oscillation cases. So maybe I can draw a picture to it. Oh, okay, I, I, I think I will not draw a picture. I will comment on the form of picture of what this means exactly. Okay, I think I can explain this later. Okay, I just give uh, some clues about the kind of schemes we are using. Uh, I spend a lot of time discussing particle trajectories because we are using schemes that are coming from particle trajectories. Okay, so the methods we are using is particle in cell methods. Uh, the starting point is that you replace your initial down, that's something that is uh, just a density of uh, particles, okay, just a combination of direct masses. And uh, the good thing about that is that uh, when you do a push forward by flow of uh, so something, this is easy to do. Okay, you just have to know the trajectories that you're coming from direct masses. Okay, but that's the key of the method. And then the only thing you have to do, instead of computing a complete discrete flow, you just have to compute these trajectories. Okay, that's, that's how the method works. Uh, in principle, because uh, uh, there are food food bad things about that. Uh, some of them is that, uh, of course, we are using this one on the so we have to solve uh, at the same time the field equation and the particle trajectory, so uh, are coupled. And the other thing is that, uh, okay, the field equation they don't have the right masses. Okay, so, uh, okay, so if you smooth the right masses in some way, but then you, you still push them as, as if you were using a push or one the right masses, so there, some, there are some errors that you do that, and you have to choose quite the parameters. Uh, okay, you can see the case here on references to the literature to explain a bit more of these kind of things. I will completely skip that. Uh, the only thing I will discuss is um, how to get a good approximation from the description. Okay, I will not discuss at all how to choose particles and how, how to choose a uh, uh, good approximation of the initial depth and uh, how to smooth correctly the references so that it's nice enough. Okay, so that's all for fit methods. Uh, now I want to discuss first discretizations of, of, of uh, okay, the ODEs. And from now on, uh, I will only do 2D and focus on large time. And for this to be easier to follow, I will uh, okay, just scale time so that uh, I'm, I'm looking at time of order 1, so now there are some epsilon and the equations. Uh, implicitly, I'm assuming that the fields are slow okay, compared to the previous cases. This is, uh, but this is, okay, I could deal with the general things just to, for an additional problems. Okay, so here is one example, oh, there are too many pieces, so I forget about some of them. Okay, anyway. uh, this is a more simple, okay, I'm looking at the homogeneous case, I just want to capture the dynamics of x, and uh, this one works, okay. The, you, I'm just doing some implicit explicit uh, error scheme. Okay, some parts are implicit, some over are explicit, and uh, there is no cost. I mean, if you look at the implicit part, uh, you, you can solve it by hand. This is easy, this is a 2D linear system, so everyone can do that. Uh, uh, and then you can replace V in the first equation. Okay, so no cost. Uh, okay. Let me just show you how this one works. Uh, I've already Explain that there are two limits. One where I fix, uh, yeah. Okay, I fix the time and I take the that equals to zero, and we go to the continuous equations. Okay, so this is okay. But now I want also to understand the, the reverse. So I fix delta t and I take f sign equals to zero. Uh, yeah, this is the inverse of and I can go back and discuss this here. Uh, so I fix delta t and I take f sign equals to zero. So if x is not going up, then the first equation tells you that this is going to zero. And once you know that, some equation tells you that V over epsilon is going to uh, the equation. Okay, and then you can plug it in the first equation and you receive uh, what is here, just the error scheme for. Okay, and this is the proposition that quantifies exactly uh, how things should not go up. Uh, but this is just to identify, and this is just a consistency that, that gives you the fact that you receive something that is an error scheme for the. And this is constant for the limiting equation. Okay. I want to do better than that. I want to get estimated and see that things are, are okay in the end. 
So let's go for estimates. So we think we already know that we, we have an error bound for the assembly limit, as epsilon. We also know that the error scheme is a first order, on the limiting model. And, and then we want to understand what happens for the full thing. Uh, okay, and there are some analysis here, but it, but it is uh, quite similar to the one on all uh, A bit more complicated, but not that much. Very, very similar, so we completely hide this. Okay. And I, I should also say that I know exactly what's the dependence of the capital O here. You can use the bounds uh, at the level of microscopic densities, discrete flow, exactly as in the, the continuous case. Okay, just using the same thing, the same topology, everything similar. Okay, so this is a good, that's good news. This is the same as in the continuous case. And uh, once you have these three things, and, and you can use the diagram, okay, you are, are four sides of the diagram, and you, you want to go this way, but you can turn around. Okay, and when you turn around, you get this error here. Yeah. Delta T plus epsilon. When you do a direct estimate, you get delta T plus epsilon. Now you have to, to do it in a careful way because okay, this, this uses the fact that your value is still right. For V, you get something that is uh, worse than that. Okay. This is using the fact that you're looking at X. Okay, and if you're interested in accuracy, then you can enter a with this minimum and, and see what the estimates are like that. They are good when epsilon is very small, they are good when epsilon is very large, and the bad part is going to be the uh, but still, this is going to zero uh, with some other uniform in epsilon. And that gives you in a precise way uh, how it's how happening. And we'll see in the simulation that this, okay, this error is not very pessimistic. This is really what you see. Okay. So you can say, I, I get this kind of bound because I'm not looking at something that is slow enough. And I'm slower, I get better at okay? And this is partly true, at least to some order. So let's do a guiding center now. So the, the, what you gain is that you have epsilon square now for the description of the dynamics. And uh, <coughs> you can do the estimate at the discrete level also. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's fine. You are just recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so it's, the, the only bad, bad thing is that instead of getting epsilon square, you get the density that that's the epsilon. Uh, so this is not bad in the accuracy estimate, just that you do not capture the you have, you have estimate, you do not capture it correctly uh, uh, at the district level. Okay, but you can, can fix that. I mean, if you, but this is easy to design schemes that are also able to get epsilon square. Okay. But uh, it's really like you fix an order that you want to see and, and you can design a scheme that works. You cannot capture all the slow things uh, uh, at once. Okay, so at least you know, on the accuracy side, this is exactly what it should be, and you get to estimate, and this is it. And you can play this game, okay, I, I don't know if you on the scheme, so you can play this game with uh, any order, with any slow variable you want. Uh, this is quite obvious, okay, this is, uh, in a sense, not hard, and so quite obvious. <coughs> okay, so let me uh, not show you uh, I are the schemes, let me, but I can show you some pictures of that. So this is this, what happens on the spatial side, and this is on the velocity side. And for the moment, epsilon is not there. So it, you're good on both the velocity and uh, the spatial trajectory and the velocity trajectory. Okay. And the green part is, you know, the, is the little drift. Okay. So there is no hope because epsilon is not you are good at uh, everywhere. Okay, and now epsilon gets is getting smaller. You're still good on the spatial trajectories. You you will stay good on the trajectory all the way. Okay, so that's normal. But you see what already starts to happen here uh, on the velocity side. Okay, already you have very strong oscillations. Uh, some of the scheme are already given up for trying to follow this strong oscillation. They are already focusing just on the liquid drift. And uh, but there is one that is still trying. Okay. It's, <coughs> And uh, okay, if you get epsilon even smaller, uh, I mean, it's still trying, but it's still, uh, you're still very good on, on special trajectory, and you know, there is no hope to get for that. Yeah. And, uh, maybe I can explain here the kind of thing that to the team in Ren, uh, the, the, the kind of thing they try to do is something quite similar to, to, the, to what is done by the black lamp, black lamp here, is that they fix correctly the, the, the time meshes, okay, like, very equally compatible with periodicity of investigation, and I try to be right on the full uh, variables at this special time. 
Okay, so it's like you, you try to ensure that this that, that this dark point they are correct on, on the compared to the velocity. Okay. You will not be able to get the full I mean full thing here, but that's obvious because you have coarse meshes, not able to reconstruct the full oscillation. But you have to if you by design suitably the scheme, you are able to ensure that you are not only correct on uh, at these discrete times on X, but also on B, okay, X and B, but only as the discrete time. Okay? And X is slow, so once you have the discrete time, you are able to interpolate and get everything for X. But for B, this is not the case. I mean, if you are very good at some specific time that are large, you cannot get B after that. Okay. Let me go now to inertial spheres. Uh, what is the issue here? I mean, I'm saying that this is much harder for many reasons. Uh, we have a simple solution, but I think this is, okay, this is not as elegant as the one before. Uh, what is the wrong thing? The wrong thing is that uh, if you look at what happens here, V is going to zero with e when epsilon goes to zero. Uh, but uh, for the kinetic energy exit with that is uh, going to something non trivial, non zero. Okay, so when time is, is continuous, that's fine. Then when you discretize time, then you're facing the trouble that there's no distinction between a weak and strong convergence. So you have to choose whether you go to zero and you don't go to zero. Okay? And so when you discretize time, you have some trouble with the fact that this should go to zero and this should not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, what, what you have chosen to do is just to add variable. Yeah, you write down the alternative formulation. You just need to add one that will account for E. And, and uh, okay, this is something that is completely equivalent to the previous system, provided you, you, you start with uh, E, which is uh, the kinetic energy of W. This is respected by your system. And now the thing is that, uh, the good thing is that when you write down the schemes, you can break the symmetry. So as to ensure that when epsilon goes to zero and you fix their data, this will go to the limiting E and this will go to zero. Okay, and uh, since this is an augmented formulation, you can even treat, use a, <coughs> add some, some terms like that, that is zero when, when W is a, when E is the kinetic energy of the CPW. Okay, so this is something that doesn't modify the continuous trajectories, but uh, you can use it to, to get things right at the discrete level. Right. Yeah, essentially what happens is that your discrete scheme, what you will do is just take this to zero, and then you get that W is like the part of that, multiplied by epsilon over v. And if you choose this thing correctly, you can replace it here and there. And uh, if you choose chi correctly, this will give you the limiting guy that you expect for for one. Here. Okay. So that's a game play. Uh, of course if you want to do this at higher order and correctly estimate this is another game, but that's the theory of the thing. Uh, so I will not show you estimate, I will show you some curves. Numerical curves. So this is the accuracy. Um, so this is on a spatial part. So you see that this remains small all the way. Okay, this is 10 to the power minus 3. And uh, this is, you see the double, okay, that there are two regimes in the estimates. Okay, so when epsilon is not, uh, it's, it's large, everything is fine. When epsilon is small, this is fine also. And then, then there is this intermediate region where well, things are not, not that nice. But not that bad either. Okay, they go to zero. Okay. And, uh, and the velocity, you see that there are two regimes, but things are getting worse and worse. And at some point, you cannot follow the velocity when I'm trying to do this. Okay. So if you, instead, you look at the synthetic, so you compare to the x, epsilon equal to your limit, uh, uh, things are getting better. Yeah, because epsilon is going to zero. And you see that there are also two kinds of regimes in velocity, and if you compare to the Wave part, then everything is nice also. This is by design, essentially. And if you compare what happens, where you put the two together, and you see what happens, you really see that there are two regimes. Like uh, you start to you try to follow the velocity, and at some point you just leave up and follow the velocity. And the scheme is doing this for you, okay? You, you don't do it, you're not tuning the parameter of the The scheme is choosing, in fact, at some point you should give up and follow the velocity. And, and you see this, this thing also in, the, in this regime. Uh, okay. And it's actually done. Uh, as I've already said, I've not get given a lot of references, so I, uh, there are many of them in our papers, so it's okay. I just didn't want to refer to the papers for many references. Uh, I want to discuss more uh, what are the open questions. There are many of them. 
uh, both on the analytic side and on the numerical side. Okay, the, on the analytic side, okay, I think this is quite clear that uh, even that for linear PDAs, we don't understand really what happens for, for uh, large time when you have complex solutions. And there are many good reasons for that. Okay. And typically, you, know, you have to think that uh, one, one of the things about many of them uh, is uh, that uh, the natural oscillation is, di is different in different zones of the phase space. Okay. You have separate traces and different oscillation of, uh, of different kind uh, in, in the phase space. Okay. So there is some hope uh, to describe what happens as long as you stay far from the separate traces, uh, but uh, okay, again, full picture on itself. Long term goal, uh, that we see now. Okay, that's quite clear that we, we are still far. I mean, the only thing, yeah, I think I already said this at the beginning, but the only thing for which we have non linear results are the PD level are Vlasov Poisson and 2D. Okay, so it's. Okay, so Vlasov Poisson we don't know, 3D we don't know, okay, that's. Now we have that are open. And, and, uh, and the results are quite weak, okay, we don't have strong conversions in the weight. Okay. Okay, another thing that is I think quite interesting is uh, uh, the fact that if, you, if you're really interested in large time, uh, I think you have to consider also collisions. Uh, collisions are weak with plasma dynamics, but if you, I mean, if you consider time that are large enough, then you, in the end you see that. Okay. And there's a complication between the, the slow dynamics and, and the, uh, the thermalization by collision. How does it work? But it depends on how collision are strong or not. Okay, this is a, and, uh, there is a first work. Uh, uh, okay, we have a first work, uh, the maxine, but this is really just a first work. Uh, many of the questions. Okay, and uh, for on the numerical side, uh, I think the main thing is that uh, we would like to to be to do the or complex three D. Even for the linear case, of course. I mean, uh, we don't want to do uh, just the. Okay, we, we want to do the non-linear uh, simulation, but we'd like to do uh, at least the linear estimates on the numerical side. And, and uh, we have some trouble, even with the case I mentioned, that we know how to deal with at the continuous level. And uh, part of it is that if you fix some specific geometry, you could choose coordinates adapted to this specific geometry. But if you want, don't want to do that, then you'll get some trouble with the fact that you'll not be able to, to conserve exactly the separation between the perpendicular plane and the parallel direction. And then you are in trouble. Okay? That's, that's not clear so far how to yeah, how you could design the scheme so that it should still work. And, 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 and this is the key thing. The separation between perpendicular and parallel interaction are very important. So this is not clear if you can redo that without uh, adapting a specific geometry. Okay. I think it starts. Are there any questions? Yeah. yeah. So at some point you mentioned that some trouble because the velocity was going to zero weakly but not strongly and you added this by but you have to solve that. Is it easy to explain why this choice just solved the problem or is there some intuition to give? Okay. Uh, yeah, I can try to do that. <coughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, the, the thing is really that uh, if you think about, uh, yeah, the trouble is that if, if you have a just infinite dimension, if v is going to zero, then v square is going to zero. Okay, and then uh, you cannot go to e, which is not zero. Okay. And then what happens here is that uh, uh, at the discrete level, you get different variables. Okay, so w will go to zero, mm -hmm. and this will account for the fact that v is going to zero, and e will go to a, a non-zero thing. And the, the thing that is broken by, by the scheme is now, this is not true anymore than E is the uh, W, the normal W square. Okay, so you, you've broken this relation at the discrete level. You start like this, but your scheme is not preserving this, this. So it, after one step, you already had separated the two things, and you can do two different convergences. Other questions? Uh, here, the method of choice was particle cell methods, and yeah. you try to study this underlying ODE system. But um, if you're studying gyrokinetic limits, can't you straight away study the PDE system without doing the 
body analysis. Okay, so there are yeah, there are two kinds of transfers. Uh, one of them is that we forbid for the, the first nominal result, the only question result by the log sign, for a slice of question, constant magic field to the then you do essentially the same manipulation but on the PE. Okay, so you, you start to write the equation for DT rho. Okay, and then you have some bad terms that you can use your equation to replace them and, and <coughs> go on. And then the point is that uh, the, the R point you know, for the distance is to get correct uniform estimate. And you can do that. And, and this is known for uh, okay, for Blazor Poisson with constant magnetic fields. This is how it is. So that you can Okay, so this is possible, and one of the things is that when you do that, uh, each, time, each time you replace something, you lose momentum in velocity. Okay, so this, is, this was already true in the ODE case, but in the ODE case this is in a way simpler because you can do the analysis and see in the end what you lose uh, in terms of momentum or optimization and things like that. And in general cases you can even lose exponential things. Okay, the, the, the number of momentum you can moments in velocity you lose can be quite high. So it's not impossible, it's just that uh, uh, at some point you have to estimate uh, how you how you lose localization in velocity. And, and, uh, there are ways that, that do this kind of things at the PD level, like moments, okay, so like, in, you know, like in Lyon's paper or things like that. Uh, but uh, this is uh, I think uh, at least that's convenient to do it at uh, the ODL level. Okay. Tracking the, the, if you start with something which is uh, compactly supported, you can track how, how it expands and things like that. Great. And uh, there is a, I mentioned that there was a, okay, at the very beginning I mentioned that one of the papers that was doing that was, uh, okay, that's so long, but there, there is a paper by Evelyn Mio that is doing things that are a bit mixed. Okay. You, you use both the characteristics and the PDE to get uh, the combination of things. And, uh, and I think in a way that is uh, better from, uh, from be better adapted to, uh, to what the equations are. Where well, you do some manipulation at the OD level and some others in PD and you go back and forth. Okay, so let's uh, thank the speaker again.